Welcome back. So this is our last episode of Cerebellum Week. I am here with Winford Dorr. Uh, he is the author of Stop Struggling in School, um, also the creator of the Zing program, www.withzing.com. Uh, I have been fascinated by his work, and uh, we're beginning to do some research together here at Amen Clinics. And... Um, We've talked about some sort of severe cases, yeah. like Susie mm -hmm. and Nina's son. Um, but I also believe that if you want to optimize your performance, mm -hmm. the first thing to do is optimize your cerebellum. Absolutely. The cerebellum is the key. I mean, why not go with 50% of the brain to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the cerebellum is so misunderstood, but so are the people who have an incompletely developed cerebellum so misunderstood. So the vast majority of children that I see struggling in school, as my book talks about, is children that I don't, don't read very much, they can't concentrate for long, and teachers often wrongly assume they're choosing not to be concentrating or they're assuming that no, they're not to, intelligent. we have to stop with that because it's so important. So many people when a child struggles or an adult struggles, they think they know why yeah. and they label them yes. as bad yeah. or unmotivated yeah. or don't care. Yeah. I cannot tell you the thousands of people who come yeah. to the clinic and I go, well, what did your teacher say about you? If only you tried harder, you'd do better. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what we've seen with the images yeah. uh, is the harder many people try, the worse it gets. I just saw a girl yesterday who's a world famous person who when she tried to concentrate, her cerebellum yeah. deactivated along yeah. with her frontal lobe deactivated. Yeah. And there is no amount of shaming yeah. There's no amount of belittling her. There's no amount of smacking her because she'd been fairly severely abused. There is no amount of that that is going to help her mm -hmm. that we need to look. I mean, that's yeah. what we do. Is we need to look and then we need to rehabilitate. Yeah, absolutely. So if you've got a child that's misunderstood, have a look at the cerebellum and find out if any aspect of the cerebellum is not yet developed because that will probably explain it. And the irony is, very often, the brighter the, the fundamental part of the brain is, the less developed the cerebellum is. So you often get these, uh, these strange situations where you've got um, savants and highly autistic people who are genius at something but totally incapable of others, a complete eccentricity. Asperger's the same. You get and that's what we see. It's a classic autism pattern on scans. They're mm. hyperfrontal, which means their frontal yeah. lobes work too hard and their cerebellums are cold. Well, They're I, just low in activity. I, I'm actually sitting here. I've, I've been with Dr. Eamon this morning, and I can hardly sit down because I'm so excited about the quality of the data. I believe that the, 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 the brain scan methods that you are using could transform the effectiveness of psychiatric conditions and all sorts of learning things too. I know what I'm doing is already extremely good, but I know you're gonna help me make it hugely better. And that so excites me. There's so, you know, one in five children are struggling, misunderstood, underperforming, and the chances are they might go right through life underperforming. One in a hundred will become a millionaire and do something even though they drop out of school as nearly all the billionaires have done. Why is that? Why is our education system not understanding that? Yeah, education because is... Because it's a brainless education <laughs> yeah. system. What if we educated people to optimize their brain? Um, you know, what a concept. But uh, so if someone's intrigued, they can get your book, Stop yep. Struggling in School. They can go to withzing.com. Get, get a copy for the teacher as well. Because often it's the teacher that's holding the child back because the teacher doesn't understand. So what are some of the practical things our listeners can do to optimize their vestibular systems and their cerebellums? Because um, if you are struggling or you just want to be your best, because I know a lot of professional athletes use this program. Oh, yeah, they do. Uh, mm -hmm. But l let's give people... Just things to think about. I often talk about on the Brain Warriors way that I play table tennis actually yep. at a really high level mm. and because I think of it as one of the best brain games. Absolutely. you got to get your eyes, your hands, and feet all to work together 
while you think about the spin on the ball and it's a strategy yeah. game. And you're right, table tennis is great for that because you've got a lot of vestibular stimulation, a lot of eye movement, a lot of coordination happening all at the same time. That's great. Brain training games, however, on the other hand, you're staring at the computer, you might be moving the mouse a bit, no vestibular stimulation. They will not create any significant lasting change in the brain. In fact, the potential is that they will actually stifle further development. You know, I've got a grandson and I'm pestering him all the time to reduce the, the screen time he spends. Get him outside, get the kids outside, get them climbing and jumping and doing all of the things that, that will stimulate their vestibular. So increased exercise, physical exercise. As is long critical. as it doesn't increase the risk for concussions. Oh yeah. So we're not hitting soccer balls with our head, right? We're not playing tackle football. We need to protect the brain. And if you did, like I did, um, you, you need to rehabilitate your brain. Yeah. So, so I have a huge, um, and you said something interesting this morning that the trampling yeah. can actually be really good as long as they don't get a concussion being crazy on the trampoline. Trampolining is, is great. Be safe with it. So is things like ballet. So anything where there's significant amounts of balance. Now, the irony is that things like skiing and surf, windsurfing and so on, these are actually very good exercises, but it doesn't activate the whole of the cerebellum. It's very good for some aspects of, of vestibular, that's balance, stimulation, but it doesn't do them all. So don't expect any of these sports to do everything. And that's why I put together a, a comprehensive program that systematically goes through every different type of vestibular stimulation and every different type of important coordination and put them together in a systematized way. But every exercise you get your child to do will make a difference. So I wonder if you know about this study from, uh, I think it was from England, where they looked at 90,000 people. Yeah. And they looked at who did what exercise and how long did you live. Ah. And so people who lived the shortest was soccer and football, American mm -hmm. football. Yeah. Peep, um, runners, it actually didn't extend their life. It was pretty interesting. Um, that people, swimmers, extended their life, mm. but people who played racket sports lived the longest. Wow. And I think of all of those, racket sports yeah. actually activate the cerebellum yeah, yeah. Um, almost more than anything else. Um, but what do you think about running and activating the cerebellum? You know, my, my thought is, but I'd love your thought, is... Well, not much because it's sort of automatic. It's completely where... automatic. And, and you're, gen you're generally going in pretty much a straight line. So there's actually relatively low levels of vestibular stimulation in that. With, with, with table tennis, you are jumping around from side to side and going back and forward. You're giving every type of stimulation possible every split second to your cerebellum. Running is, is yeah, it's good maybe for your cardio and so on. But in terms of vestibular stimulation, it's not going to do much. And so walking wouldn't really do very much for vestibular no, stimulation. No, walking's not, and then unless you're doing an obstacle course, pool or and like things that. like that, they're fun, but they're not going to they're not going to help your brain that much. Interesting. All right. So, what are some of the exercises people can do for vestibular stimulation? Well, if you got uh, if you look on if you actually look in my book, we actually give a load of free exercises away, things you can do, and they're things like getting your child to balance on one leg and then shutting one eye. Be careful when you do that so they don't hurt themselves, because the more you the more you can stand on one leg and then shut your eye. Yeah, try it, Dr. Raymond. Is oh, so now I'm out of the thing. Now when I shut both eyes. It begins to wobble. Yeah. There's actually um, how long you can keep your eyes closed on one leg determines your brain's age. Exactly. Well, you can bring your brain's so age down. I used to down. practice one leg. Yeah. How long can I stand? Yeah. You can actually bring your brain's age down. So if your child is, say, 10 years of age and can only stand on one leg with his or her eyes closed for about 10 seconds, if they can only do that, then they've got some more development, they've got some more potential you're waiting to discover. So that's a kind of general rule of thumb. So standing on one leg is great. Getting them to spin around, 
is is another thing. Get them to jump on one leg and spin in a jump around in a circle, and then get them to shut one eye whilst they do that. Or any exercise that involves jumping, spinning, standing on one leg, especially with your eyes closed, all of those are going to force the vestibular to be exercised, which in turn forces this electrician at the back here, the cerebellum, to do some more fundamental wiring. Do you think that's why autistic kids tend to flap or spin as an attempt to try to st stimulate that system? Well, it's interesting. I, I think there's some inhibition things going on there as well, which is a slightly different issue. So they've got reduced control of, of, of to stop things happening. But many autistic children come alive if you take them to a fun fair. If they go round and round or going up and down, they're smiling. They're often, not always, but they're often at their happiest when they've got huge amounts of vestibular stimulation. Or if you take a young child that's autistic into a swimming pool and you throw them up and down in the water, they love it. So you get more happiness, more joy when the vestibular is stimulated, the cerebellum is doing its job, and their whole brain comes alive and is functioning more normally. And the people who would benefit from Zing, um, there's so many kids. And Chloe, my 14-year-old, who I adore when I scanned her, mm -hmm. very busy frontal lobes, mm -hmm. very quiet cerebellum and she's not in any and way huge autistic. potential then huge potential not in any way autistic mm. but um knowing that is we knew why she would quit when she started a sport yeah. if she wasn't perfect so mm. this hyperfrontal often goes with yeah, perfectionism yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which she clearly has and so when she saw it she's like okay i understand why i have mm. to do coordination exercises and dance yeah. made a huge yeah, positive difference yeah. for her i am trying to get her to do zing so it's well children it, do not always listen to their parents no and it's it's not <laughs> it's not as easy as taking a pill but it develops naturally and in a lasting way the kind of thing that's going to make a, a lifelong difference. So if you think like when you, run, when you learn to ride a bike, you don't do it in a second. You m might know what to do because you've watched people riding a bike. But until you've practiced and practiced and practiced, you can't ride. You fall off. When finally the cerebellum has done its job and made all of those coordinative links, you can get on a bike without thinking about it and ride automatically. Oh, so many kids who are anxious about riding a bike or learning yeah. how to swim often have an underdeveloped cerebellum yeah. and if you go through the program and um, the program is 10 minutes twice a day and often after a month people notice significant benefit they do and but you recommend they do it for about six months yeah it look it's, it's not a it's not a quick thing it's 10 minutes twice a day for six months but if you've got a child struggling at school if you've got a child that's got potential and no one is finding it do you really want them to go right through their life without discovering it? You know, I, the, I right. I mean, six months is like a drop in the bucket. For uh, absolutely. People. And you know, one of the interesting things I know that your partner is also very interested in diet. Absolutely. And nutrition. And there's yeah. studies on gluten yeah. turning off the cerebellum. Yeah. Uh, ah. There's actually a spec study with gluten turning off the cerebellum. Wow. And in another study. 40% of people with cerebellar dyspraxia, so that's yeah. where the cerebellum's not working, yeah. um, is from a gluten sensitivity. Wow. And that's why so many of our autistic and ADD kids do better when we get rid of gluten and dairy. Mm. Uh, so, well, thank you so much for being part of Cerebellar Week uh, here on the Brain Warriors Way podcast. I want everyone to look at, you can get it on Amazon right now, Stop Struggling mm -hmm. in School, go to withzing.com uh, to learn about it. Stay tuned here. We'll talk more about it as we get our research projects underway with Winfred Dorr. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.